And I think, uh, Dr. Bloom, if you're ready, we can start with you. And basically what we'll have you do is uh, tell us a little bit about the Cardiothoracic Fellowship, sort of how you apply to it, um, and what it means to transition from being general surgery to a CT fellow um, here at the MGH. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Maggie, for inviting me. Uh, my name is Jordan Bloom. I did, uh, I started in general surgery at the MGH in, uh, in 2011 with uh, some of my colleagues here on the call and then uh, did uh, three years of general surgery, went into the lab for three years and during that time applied and, and was accepted to our 4-3 training program. And then I finished the general surgery training and now I'm in my final, started, about to start my final year of CT training as a PGY-10, actually soon to be PGY-11. So that's kind of my background. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of your questions, uh, so, you know, I know there's a lot of CT interest uh, with, it, with, uh, with the folks on the call. We do not have the I-6 training program at Mass General, which I'm sure you're all aware of. And so the two ways into our program would be to complete five years of general surgery and then, uh, and then join us for what will become, by the time any of you would be training, a three-year uh, fellowship, or we actually, it's actually a residency in cardiothoracic surgery, or to do the four plus three. And the four plus three as it stands now, uh, you would apply for that during your research time, or if you're not doing research during your PGY3 clinical year. Uh, and uh, that will uh, be a true four three, and by that I mean, it would shave one year of train of time off of your training such that you would do four years of general surgery, three years of cardiothoracic surgery, and be board eligible in both general and cardiothoracic surgery. Uh, the, so I mentioned when you would apply for that and how that works. Um, the way we have it split now is likely the way it will stay, which is your six months of your PGY four year, you do general, uh, general surgery, and then three months of each cardiac and thoracic surgery and then during your PGY five year it's the same split so you give up six months of that golden chief year uh, to kind of uh, uh, be a be a junior body what we call a junior fellow on the both cardiac and thoracic services but the major benefit obviously is early integration and guaranteed acceptance into a training program uh, there is definitely a cost to it, which uh, is to lose six months of the chief year of general surgery, which anybody who's completed that, some of who, whom are on the call would know that, would agree that that is, that is sort of what you, what you have worked for those, those four prior years, and it's really a great year. So I'd be happy to talk uh, to any of you offline about, um, you know, how I view the, this, that sort of decision tree, uh, because it is a big decision. Uh, but with that, I think I'll stop, Maggie. And uh, is there anything else that you want me to address that I haven't? Um, if anyone has questions and you want to ask them vocally, you're more than uh, welcome to. If you want to put them in the chat, too, uh, we have several residents who are on the call that are going to respond in the chat. And I will try to monitor, but it's hard for the speaker and for me to follow. So just if we don't get to your question, make sure that um, that we know that it's there. Um, I uh, I don't know if you if you covered this one, Jordan. Somebody asked, uh, when do uh, the four three cardiac surgery residents take their research time? Yeah, good question. So again, in, until you become a member of our four three, which happens sort of either during research or during the PGY three year for people who aren't going to do dedicated research time, you know, you're you're a general surgery resident, and in our residency as probably most of you know by now from the overload of information that it typically exists by this point. Most of us go out after our third year. Uh, there are situations where people go out after their second year and the program is extremely flexible um, in accommodating everybody's needs based on their own lives. And there are people on this uh, group that have gone out after PGY2 and people that have gone out after PGY3, but the overwhelming majority after PGY3. The other thing I should just briefly mention is that we have four spots per year. Two of those are thoracic tract and two of those are cardiac tract. 
and we like to keep at least one of those four spots open to external applicants. And, and Dr. Sunt, our chief of cardiac surgery and program director, feels very strongly about preserving a spot for external applicants. So, yeah. Great. And um, how about, uh, as far as you know, um, what do the CT residents go on to do? What types of surgery or practice do they have? Uh, is that a spe specifically for the 4-3 trainees, Maggie, or for all trainees? The question was graduates, um, so maybe just 4-3. I, yeah. I have a list of what everyone's done in terms of fellowship that we can cover later. But sure. how about and our, our revamped website, which, you know, has moved from like a D minus to maybe a B minus, um, uh, at least has all of the information for about the last 10 years of trainees and where they've gone. But you'll see a really nice mix of people going to sort of the top academic medical centers around to great private practice jobs uh, to, you know, sort of the full spectrum of, of jobs. I mean, listen, there are a lot of things that should come into your, your Excel sheet, your decision tree when deciding on a program, you know, getting a good job out of this program or any of the other really good training programs in the country of which there are many is not a concern. If you come to the MGH or any of the other great training programs in the country, you're going to get a great job. So I really don't think that, I think you can check that box. Perfect. And we have one uh, question in the chat here. What's the internal application process for the 4-3 and CT? And do you get pushback from the general surgery residency leadership or are they supportive? Yeah, those are great questions. Uh, I'll try to be really brief. The, the, the application process has evolved over the years from a give them a thumbs up and they'll take you to now a much more formal process where at least you're supposed to meet with each one of the surgeons. The big variable that you can't predict is who else wants to do it. So if you're in a class with five people that are interested, then there will be a selection process. If you're in a class where you're the only person that wants to do cardiac and you're not a complete loser, then you're, you're, you're probably pretty much guaranteed. Um, in terms of pushback from general surgery, I'll tell you straight up that both Dr. Mullen and Dr. Lillamo, who are not cardiothoracic surgeons, get a little bent out of shape when you choose CT and they just say, man, I don't know why we, have so, why we make so many CT surgeons in this program. But it's not like you ever feel like you're not a citizen. And, you know, when I did Dr. Berger's service as a chief resident, I don't feel that he treated me any differently. I never felt like an ugly stepchild or anything. But sure, Dr. Lolomo wants you to be a pancreas surgeon. Dr. Mullen wants you to be a sarcoma surgeon. Cornelia may want you to be a uh, pediatric surgeon. You know, we all kind of want to make what we are. But, but I think we're all very well accepting whether you want to do cardiac, plastics, or even what, whether you want to be an asshole surgeon like Rob. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Jordan. Um, I at least I'm wearing pants. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I think that's a perfect transition uh, from CT over to Dr. Griggs and Dr. Goldstone. Thank you, Dr. Bloom, for joining us. Um, these two are going to tell us a little bit about their journey as a couple, as surgery <laughs> residents, um, and moving on to becoming attendings as well. It all started on The Bachelorette. Yeah, I was going to say hashtag <laughs> bachelor, whatever it is, right? But that's the only thing I can think of when anyone describes a relationship as a journey. Um, but uh, it's nice to see all of you. Uh, my name's Cornelia Griggs. I'm Rob Goldstone. We formally gave a really um, embarrassing slideshow at the in-person applicant events. Um, and so we are very excited to re-debut um, that show tonight. But um, we both graduated from the general surgery residency here in 2018 and then went uh, to New York City to do our fellowships. Um, Rob is now a colorectal surgeon I am now a pediatric surgeon and we both were rehired by Mother MGH. And so we are back home. Um, and I would say father, right? Father MGH. No. Yeah. But um, I guess 
one of the important things to highlight, which is kind of unusual about our relationship and our program is that a lot of places that you go and where you interview, they will tell you that the residency program feels like a family. Um, ours actually is a family <laughs> and we very much keep it in the family. And I think the fact that um, our relationship was able to thrive and grow and stay intact throughout our residency and our fellowship is in a lot of ways a testament to the support that we received here in addition to um, the fact that we're both awesome. But no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Wow. Um, <laughs> um, but I think one of the things that uh, a lot of programs don't necessarily talk about is what it's like what it's like to balance a personal life while being a resident you know and you guys might not have a lot of questions about that but it should be an important part of your thought process and your consideration when you are applying to different programs because you want to train somewhere not only where you get excellent training but where you're you going your to be, significant other yeah where you're going to be happy so rob and i met on the interview trail um which is an important thing for all of you to keep in mind like keep your eyes and ears open your future spouse may be on this call um this or zoom. This, zoom. this zoom, this zoom. Um, maybe some of you already have a spouse um and that's great too um this program has a long and rich history of um productivity both academically and quite literally in terms of fertility as you can tell by some of the small creatures that may pop in and out of this Zoom call um, for people who are at home. Um, Rob and I have two kids. We have a five-year-old and a two-and-a-half-year-old. Um, and I had both of them when I was resident here. We had both of them. I had them. I made it's them. It's hard on the husband. <laughs> Jordan was um. co-interns with Rob. Which is why you made them together, but you had them, Cornelia. Come on. I I grew them. I made them. <laughs> he contributed some DNA. Um, but know that if you come here for residency, um, your attendings and your fellow residents want you to be happy and to be able to show up to your job as a whole person in every sense of the word. And um, I don't know, do you wanna say anything? I mean, so when I was looking for residency, I was looking for a place that really was like family. I mean, you spend a lot of time in the hospital. You spend a lot of time with your colleagues. And for me, if I was gonna leave New York City where I was born and raised, I wanted a place where I saw that I would be having a lot of friends to share the long days and nights with. And I felt that way with MGH. In fact, it came the time when Cornelia, we met on the interview trail, but it's not like we were like, oh, we're getting married on the interview trail. I mean, we stayed friends and then she went to Columbia and I went to MGH. And from there, we had stayed talking to each other. And then Lilimo paged me when I was on pediatric surgery. And of course she's a pediatric surgeon now and I definitely couldn't do it. but. Uh, she Lilmo page me saying they were expanding the program by one person and he knew she was interested but she didn't choose mgh she wanted columbia in the beginning and i wanted mgh but then so she came but then columbia offered me a spot there and so the question was was what do we do and you know she let me choose here and i think it worked out the best for the both of us because we both loved it. and we always said oh we'll live the rest of our lives in new york but in all honesty you know we obviously loved it here because this place kept me from going back to New York and had us taking jobs here. Uh, I still feel like my mentors are my mentors here. My colleagues are my colleagues. I guess Jordan Bloom is a colleague, maybe, I don't know. He's still training for 15, 16 years. So. Yeah, take, but, uh, trust me, like, we don't, you don't brag about PGY 11. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would also like to add that Rob was completely miserable and hated everything about Boston until Cornelia came into the picture. And so really all the credit to Rob's happiness in Boston is owed to Cornelia. <laughs> fact, fact. But then I moved back because I really like it here. And I got to say, really, though, everyone is super friendly. Uh, and uh, Not everyone is super friendly, but everyone is a good person. <laughs> I don't know. I think everyone is, everyone's friendly with me. 
I don't know. Okay. Everyone's pretty nice to me. So I, I get along well with people and I think that, um, that it's just a great, it's a great environment, you know, between like liver rounds if you know, COVID ends hopefully soon with the vaccinations that are coming out and, uh, presidency but uh i think that it, it'll just be uh it'll be better and better and be more back to normal thanks guys does anyone have any questions for the greg stones well thank you for sharing your journey you can tell i've seen the bachelorette before <laughs> it's a journey but it's <laughs> amazing uh, but all of you, if you have any questions that one of us can answer specifically, um, we are available to you to talk about all dimensions of the residency. Um, we're both participating in the interviews as well. So I hope I get to see some of you on panels. And um, I just am very excited for all of you that you're embarking on this romantic journey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, we also have a couple of people who wanted to say hi briefly. So in between our topics, I believe Dr. Lilimo is on the call now. You guys want to say hello? Yeah, thanks, Maggie. Um, we're, it's a tough act to follow Cornelia and Rob in a lot of different ways, but uh, uh, John and I uh, had, had just been together in a meeting and we wanted to run up and say hi. Uh, we're we're certainly uh, looking forward to meeting a, a number of you. Uh, I haven't seen how many people are actually on the list, but uh, uh, 102, like 100. 102, that's, that's a great turnout. Uh, uh, we really appreciate the efforts that, that the residents and fellows have done to uh, sort of introduce our program to you. And, and uh, we hope we get a chance to show it to you a little bit more closely uh, in the uh, Zoom interview process. John? Hi, everybody. It's great to uh, see you all. Thanks uh, for joining uh, which, what I guess is the third uh, webinar that uh, Maggie and the residents have put together. And really, uh, we're grateful to them for doing this because I think uh, they're really the uh, people who know, know our program best and can tell you all the nitty gritty details about it. So uh, hopefully we'll see many of you uh, during the interview season. And um, thanks for inviting us to say hi. Thanks for joining. I don't know if we have any chance to take uh, questions, but uh, Maggie, is there anything that you thought would be uh, be helpful? Um, I we will we'll answer a whole bunch of questions. Um, but if anyone on here now has specific questions, you want to either put in the chat or ask. Um, now's your time. Thank you guys, they're free. You're welcome to stay on and, and watch as we keep going, but I know you're busy, so. Um, yeah, we, we left the rest of the team down in another meeting, so uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna head back to where we were. So thanks so much. We appreciate you joining. Yep, bye. Bye everybody. Go Ravens, Maggie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie, tell them why you matched here, right? You could, only chair you could find was a Ravens fan. That's true. <laughs> Actually, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and a Yankee fan. And a Yankee fan. Uh, great. All right. So next, uh, Dr. Albert is going to talk to us a little bit about global surgery. A number of you sent in some questions about, um, about that uh, as part of your professional development time and as part of residency. And she's also uh, just finished her residency and is now in our trauma critical care fellowship here as well. Hey guys, um, thanks for being here. As Maggie said, uh, my name's Kat and um, I was one of the COVID general surgery residency graduates and um, now I am a uh, ICU fellow where I'm getting to experience more COVID. Um, but uh, my main clinical interest is in uh, trauma. So um, my life um, sort of long before medical school and uh, in medical school was always, um, always had a component of global health in it. I spent a lot of time living and working abroad before I went to medical school. And I knew that that was something that I was interested in, in continuing um, regardless of which sort of specialty I ended up in. And, um, 
while I was a medical student, I had like this big life crisis because I was like, can I really do what I love clinically with what I want to do globally? Um, and did those things fit together? Um, and fortunately, I was a medical student right around the time where people were actually starting to think about surgery as a public health crisis and think about like the creative ways that we can put these things together and really try and make a dent in, in the surgical burden of disease. Um, and so it was a good time to, to try and embark on a, that dual pathway. And that's one that I'm um, still pretty committed to. Um, so coming in with with my background, I already had an MPH um, that I got while I was a medical student here. I was also a medical student um, at, at Harvard, so I knew MGH well, so I sort of knew what I was getting myself into. Um, and I did my first uh, three years of clinical residency, and then I went into the lab. Um, and we'll use the lab in inverted commas because uh, the lab at MGH means different things to different people. Um, and my research time, I spent pretty much exclusively living and working in Uganda. Um, I did it uh, through uh, both MGH and uh, an affiliate program that we have here called the Program in Global Surgery and Social Change, which is run by John Mira, who's one of the senior authors on the Lancet Commission Report. Um, and so I worked in Uganda and uh, elsewhere around the world in, in you know, tens of different countries, um, working on improving access to, to surgical care. Um, and we did a nationwide study in Uganda, which is what I spent most of my time doing. Um, it was pretty uh, heavily supported uh, by the MGH in terms of funding and stipends and um, fully covered in that, you know, in the sense that I was, I got my full salary I had the money available necessary to do the work, um, and I had the full institutional support of the Harvard School of Public Health, Boston Children's, and MGH behind me. Um, so it's a really, uh, I think it's a rare, rare combination of resources to have at your disposal when you want to do something that is, uh, is obviously not a money maker. Um, we do have a global surgery track at uh, Mass General. It's uh, more of a sort of set of options that are available. Um, for those who are interested and less uh, like a rigid pathway that you must uh, pursue. The things that that track includes is research time as a, as a member of the PGSSC, uh, as well as the possibility of international elective time and other uh, electives. So clinically, um, as a global surgeon, you're expected to do more than general surgery. So I spent some of my PGY4 elective time doing uh, OB and ortho just so I would have a better sort of rounder grasp on things that I might encounter abroad. Um, it's not a like a uh, number limited program. Um, so it's not like only one person or only two people could do it. Uh, I'd say that the interest and commitment to global surgery waxes and wanes over the years. Um, and uh, I think the department's commitment to it really um, reflects the commitment of the members of the department to it. So, you know, my experience has been that Dr. Lomo and Dr. Mullen, as Maggie alluded to, are uh, pancreas surgeons and surgical oncologists, both of whom do not personally do any uh, global surgical work, uh, but who are both fully invested in supporting their residents who are interested in doing that. So I think the stance of the MGH is that uh, if if you are a part of this community, whether as a resident or a fellow or a faculty member, and you have something that is academically valuable that you are passionate about, um, they will support you in doing that, which I think is a really, really neat thing. Um, and that goes for education and, and health services research and all of the other things also. Um, I'm happy to answer any specific questions about global surgery or different places or what international electives could look like. Um, I didn't actually do any clinical international electives because I had spent so much time abroad um, and I did work clinically while I was also abroad that I didn't feel like that was a, a, a great use of my PG by four time. Um, but we're in the process of trying to revamp that um, also. So happy to, to answer any questions. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, I think there was one question also about trauma that I was supposed to answer. Um, hi, Mags, which was... Um, 
how com the question was how comfortable residents feel with managing trauma and how the volume is here. Um, and uh, this is a question that I had a lot um, when I was trying to think about where I wanted to be. Uh, Boston is not a particularly violent city and I sort of had an inclination that I wanted to be a trauma surgeon. So one of the, th the things that I was debating in my mind was like, do I, do I need to go to uh, Baltimore or Miami or somewhere else where there's uh, more of a gun and knife club to get the necessary exposure to trauma. And um, one of the things that I sort of concluded was that my priority for, for residency training was to become the best surgeon I could be. And the rest would come with that. Um, and I'm really, really glad I made that decision. Obviously I decided to stay on here for further training. So I can ensure you that the trauma volume is not that bad. Um, the mix of penetrating and blunt injury is perhaps not what you would find in Baltimore, but we have more than enough of it to become comfortable. Um, you know, just last week in the ICU, I crashed a patient who had had blunt thoracic trauma, bled three liters out of his chest onto BB ECMO. Um, you know, so there's, there's some weird, weird shit that happens here, but there's definitely not a problem with volume. And the Churchill service, which is the trauma service, is uh, exclusively run by the senior residents who are PGY4s during the daytime and PGY5s overnight, where you have complete ownership of the patient. So it's a really, really nice um, sort of responsibility and transition to independent practice. I'll stop there. I'll put my name in the chat. Feel free to email me uh, with any questions at all. I did get one question in the chat that's asking essentially about were you able to do any of this of your globally focused research or building what you were going to do in research as a clinical resident. So how did you prepare to do um, your your research time or your lab time um, abroad and and that also is is a similar question to some of the other words other questions we got is basically how do you prepare. Yeah, and I think it, the the answer is it, it largely depends on how much of a vision I think you have for what you want to do. And um, if you have a vision, this is the kind of place where that vision can, you can be plugged into the necessary resources to make that vision happen and you can run with it. Uh, for me, I, I sort of knew that my research was going to be global surgery focused and that I was going to end up um, as a member of the, the program in global surgery. Um, and so I didn't have to do a whole lot of planning or thinking about that. I ended up in Uganda uh, as my primary location, largely because MGH has uh, essentially a, a strong foothold in Southwest Uganda, where uh, we actually have like a guest house and a fully functional year round program where we have ongoing exchanges and, and other things. So it was a good foothold to, to build a, a countrywide study from, which is what I ended up doing for most of my research time. Um, but uh, it basically, it can work if you start planning when you arrive or when you are a PGY3 thinking like, oh my God, what am I gonna do next year? And uh, it works both ways. They have more structure now uh, than they used to in terms of planning for the research time. So I think there's a, a lot of support available for that. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. This is great. Um, you are free to uh, exit or you can stay on and, and continue to learn about our program. Um, and next we have, we'll transition uh, from global uh, research or professional development time into uh, international medical graduates. So we've gotten a lot of questions about that. And we have two residents on the call who are each gonna talk a little bit about um, how they got here in terms of being IMGs. And then I've got some numbers answers to some of the questions you have about IMG in our program. So Ted, if you don't mind, we'll start with you. Hi everyone, thank you for joining and thank you Maggie for putting this together. Um, it's great that the program is showing some, is showing a lot of interest to IMGs, uh, but let me first tell you a little bit about my story and how I, I'm, uh, how I ended up here. So I graduated uh, medical school in Athens, Greece, 
uh, and then after doing uh, some other necessary things in Greece like military service and whatnot, then I joined uh, a lab at the MGH, specifically working with uh, Dr. Ferroni and doing some uh, wet lab and uh, clinical research um, on uh, surgical oncology, pancreatic surgery, um, and HPB research in general. And following two years of uh, research in that lab, then I joined the residency program as a prelim resident. Uh, this, was for, this was for two years. And after those two years, I went back to the lab for another two years. And currently, I'm on my second year of my research time. Uh, after this, I'll come back as a PGY3 and I'll um, continue in the program. Um, as you can see, only from the for the from the fact that uh, there are so many internationals IMGs in the program, the program shows a lot of uh, interest to this program. And if you if you have a look at uh, the list of attendings, fellows, residents, or research fellows, you see that uh, the program shows a lot of interest to IMGs. So uh, another question was, was it hard to uh, for an IMG to get into the program? So you see, um, there are many people who have done it, so you cannot quantify how hard uh, something can be, but it's definitely doable. Um, are there any specific questions, Maggie, I can answer? Uh, it seems that there are several, um, but are there some which you think are more important? So I'll have um, Antonia, if you're on here and ready to talk, I'll have you tell your story too. And then I'll just, I'll pose some of these questions and either one of you can answer them. Perfect. Yeah, this works for me. Hi, everybody. I'm Antonia. I'm one of the fifth year residents currently in the program. And um, I joined the program about five years ago. I did all of my training up in Canada and um, I was the only person in my class to be an international person. Um, in terms of applying to the program and how eager they are to have international people, I would say I got the feeling that it was, um, I didn't felt, feel like I was treated or had bigger barriers in terms of the application than anybody else. One of the main things is um, obviously a personal barrier. Um, training somewhere else and doing fellowship there and residency there, it's much easier. So for me, it was a lot of effort to step out of the Canadian system and then uh, only apply to the US system, which was um, a little bit more risky because I had done no clinical rotations um, or I had done one clinical uh, sabai here. And it's a little bit of a different system in Canada. And uh, I think given the current political climate and all of the variability associated with it, it's hard to predict how easy it's going to be to apply and what the rules are going to be on travel and so forth. But um, everybody, whatever country you're from, it's gonna be an individualized kind of series of events. Um, the one good thing is that we have Barbara Wolf, who is one of our program administrators, and she has been um, more than essential for me to get here and to do all the paperwork every year she emails with these are the things you need to do to fill out to renew your things so it's really uh, easy and very effortless in terms of uh, staying in the program and renewing all of your visa associated items and uh, I I, I can only say good things about her and I think she's the key person to ask any questions related to the visa. They're very knowledgeable and it's, it's really not much of a, a large headache in terms of getting all the paperwork organized, aside from the fact that you must, you have to go through all of the initial steps from your own institution. Um, uh, to get here. One of the things that I consider when I was applying um, was uh, really the the clinical environment. And I think uh, seeing, as Ted said, there's a lot of attendings who are, um, you know, classically MGH trained who stayed at MGH, with, which I think is a very important sign as to how good the training programs are. And then they also hire people from all over the place. And uh, it, it's really a very welcoming environment. Uh, me having trained in Toronto, where it was very uh, multicultural, I felt very much at home and it was uh, an easy transition, I would say. I'm staying on to do the uh, four three CT fellowship uh, here as well, and um, when you if you do that, then all of the visa related issues just go on to the next uh, um, residency admin person to help with. Um, and it so far hasn't been much of an issue. Awesome. Um, between the two of you, you've answered a whole lot of the questions that we've gotten. 
I will answer some of them now. And as I'm doing this, maybe people want to put any questions in the chat for Ted and for Antonia. Um, somebody or a couple of people asked uh, how do or how often do people IMGs who are here as prelims match to the MGH? And so in the past 10 years of the prelim IMG residents, seven of them have been offered categorical positions here at the MGH. Um, Ted is one of them. And, um, and otherwise, Dr. Mullen and Dr. Lillamo uh, really are helpful in terms of getting interviews elsewhere for our prelims. And they published a study or a paper about the success rate that they've had here in getting the prelims matched to the categorical positions they want elsewhere. Um, it may be that you end up going on to be an intern at that program again after having done your prelim year or sometimes people are able to find a spot as a PGY2 or a PGY3. And we do have residents stay on as a second year prelim year sort of in in the um as part of the whole process here um so i think that answers that question um there is question um will the program director consider my application if i have all the step scores and certifications but don't have experience in the u.s antonia i answered that one uh, you don't have to do a clinical rotation here in order to be considered. And then yeah, I think one, sorry to interrupt Maggie, but one thing that is important is um, to have letters that are um, that are by people whom the um, the other attendings at MGH may know. Um, so if you don't have anything like that, it does make a lot of sense to do a clinical rotation close by or at, or at the MGH. Um, so just that they have an, a person who they know um, and trust who can say something on your behalf. I think that matters a lot. Great. Um, somebody else asked um, if I've done some training outside of the US, do I still have to start as an intern? And the answer is yes, you have to start as an intern um, as part of our program. I don't know that there are other places that would allow you to, to transfer time from out of the country. Um, so at least at the MGH, you have to start as an intern for your first year in the US. Um, uh, somebody asked if interviews can be held virtually for IMGs. L lucky you, they're held virtually for everybody. Um, have we gotten any questions in the chat? Well, I, I don't think so. Um, um, just can I say some uh, few additional things? Uh, Antonia mentioned how supporting the program is uh, with Barbara being very extremely helpful, but also Dr. Malin and, and Dr. Lilima will do anything they can to uh, support you, even if you're an IMG. So, for example, this is what happened in my case, where I ran into some visa problems and because of this and the support of the program, I was able to go uh, to research after my second year, uh, despite the fact uh, that most people do it after the third year. And on top of that, you have to consider other things. For example, MGH is a huge organization and they have uh, a lot of manpower, legal teams and whatnot to help you if you run into any uh, visa issues, which is, of course, something um, you want to consider. And the other thing is you heard the numbers about prelims uh, staying on as categoricals and some other big program, programs have uh, some, uh, some numbers which uh, they predetermine. And you heard that at MGH, this number is actually pretty high. I wasn't aware of this number, but it seems it's pretty high. So you shouldn't be deterred by the fact that you might have the opportunity to start off as a prelim in a big program. And even if you don't stay on and you go to another program, uh, there's nothing better than having done one or two years at a major program like uh, the one at MGH. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, when I was a medical student, one of my chief residents had done his prelim year as a IMG at the MGH and he was excellent. Um, and he had learned a lot here and, and he was a, a great teacher. Um, another question is, can, uh, can students who trained in the Caribbean uh, get into the MGH? We have uh, in the past 10 years, somebody has um, been a resident here front that trained in the Caribbean. It's not the most common, but it's not 
impossible and it's certainly not something that eliminates you from being uh, selected from an interview for an interview. Um, there's another question about being an IMG and looking for research opportunities. I think Ted has sort of answered that already, but uh, yes, and that's often a way that people do end up uh, sort of transitioning from outside of the country into our residency program is by spending uh, some time doing research at one of the many, many, many labs at the MGH and forming relationships, getting the letters like Antonia mentioned, um, and developing the relationships to help guide you into the program here or doing so elsewhere. Um, that answers a lot of the questions. I'm sure there are still more questions about IMG. Uh, do either of you have anything else you want to mention before we move on? Uh, if anyone wants to contact uh, me for anything related to IMGs or visas or anything of that sort, I'll type my email and you can contact me. Yeah, same here, especially the Canadian system. I am very uh, well versed in, so I'm happy to help uh, anyone transition uh, from the US uh, from the Canadian system to the US system. Awesome, thank you. All right, next topic is also a big one. So we're gonna move on to education and simulation and Kristen is gonna start us with that. And then we have several residents on the call as well who are gonna help her to answer some of the questions you have about uh, education here. Thanks, Maggie. Um, and I couldn't not do a PowerPoint. So if at any point, um, I promise this will only take like five minutes, but if the PowerPoint gets boring, just put it in the chat and I will uh, stop. But I'm just gonna give a quick overview of the SIM curriculum and some teaching opportunities that the applicants inquired about. And then Doug Cassidy, um, one of the members of the Cassidy Westfall household, and a PGY4 is gonna talk about the Absite curriculum and didactics for a bit. Um, and then we, along with Sophia McKinley, one of the current chiefs, um, all of whom have completed the Surgical Education Research Fellowship, I will take questions from the chat. So the MGH follows the American College of Surgeons and the Association of Program Directors and Surgery Resident Skills Curriculum. And this national curriculum is designed to improve operating room preparation through a simulation-based surgical skill development program. And the technical skill simulations that you can see here range from chest tube placement to percutaneous tracheostomy to vascular and hand sewn ball anastomoses. The simulation sessions are from 11 until 1 p.m., so two hours per week each Thursday, and the PGY 1s through 3s will focus on a new skill each month. So we'll do one of these um, each month and then switch off. And then here you can see Drs. Mullen and Lillimo, who you met earlier on the call, um, taking time out of their busy schedules to teach residents during simulation. So um, that's very special. They obviously care a lot about feedback, not just in the OR and at formal sit down feedback sessions, but all of them uh, are, or both of them are very eager to volunteer for our simulation curriculum. And then in addition, not pictured here, are the many faculty who will often move OR schedules, clinic time, um, just so they can participate and teach in our simulation curriculum. Dr. Goldstone, who you met earlier, uh, he has been known to book off OR times and reschedule OR cases uh, in order to make it to our endoscopy curriculum, which I don't think I can emphasize enough how unique that is uh, to have faculty who are willing to do that. And then in addition to the ACS APDS resident skills curriculum that covers the entire um, 12 month academic year. As a resident, you'll complete an endoscopy curriculum and a laparoscopy training in order to prepare you to, pre in order to prepare to pass um, the national FES and FLS exams that all residents, no matter what residency you go to here in the US have to take. At the MGH, you'll take the FES and FLS exams during your second and third years. And so uh, the simulation curriculum gears you up for those exams. There's also a robotic training pathway that incorporates simulation, bedside learning, and console cases over the course of your five years. And so here you can see Dr. Sell, uh, one of the residents, completing a robotic colectomy during a cadaver lab that we hosted. And here she's being coached by Dr. Goldstone. Uh, he's telestrating here similar to how he would in the robotic OR as a way for her to practice that uh, before doing robotic colectomies with him uh, in vivo. And then in addition to the formal curricula, 
The simulation lab has a ton of supplies uh, for individual practice on technical skills. The robotic simulator is available 24 seven for you to complete modules and make your way through the training pathway curriculum. And then uh, it's really nice because here you can see there's a mirrored computer monitor. So a senior resident or a faculty member, if they're free, uh, can come to the sim lab with you and provide coaching and instruction as you complete the simulations, uh, similar to when faculty telestrate or coach you in the robotic ORs. And so as you um, virtually see places, unfortunately, you're not able to kind of walk through their sim labs this year, but uh, this is pretty unique. I know when I, uh, I know at various hospitals, not everyone has this mirror image, and it's nice because that way you can get that coaching practice uh, in the lab before you actually get to trial it out in the OR. And since people had asked about feedback, that's another me um, method for teaching and feedback. And then in addition, there are phone holders uh, that we mount above each technical skill station. So you can always video record your technical skill performance during the weekly sims. And you can review those later for your own um, personal growth and then also receive peer or faculty feedback. And then um, a lot of people asked about opportunities to teach, which makes me really excited, um, as I'm sure Dr. McKinley and Dr. Um, uh, Cassidy are also excited about that. So all research residents are offered a residence as teachers workshop at the start of their lab time as an opportunity to formally grow as educators. And then in addition to daily peer teaching that you'll do on rounds in the OR, there are opportunities to teach during our weekly sim, sim sessions that we just talked about, uh, where research residents and senior residents can teach junior residents on these technical skills. This teaching often extends outside of the Department of Surgery, and so surgery residents will also work with EM residents on interdisciplinary trauma scenarios, and they'll help lead uh, our surgery department leads a chest tube placement simulation session for the EM residents as well. So as you can see here, uh, um, Dr. Connolly is helping one of the EM residents, walking him through how to do a chest tube today. So she volunteers for our sessions a lot. So thank you, Maggie. And then here we have our interdisciplinary trauma scenario, uh, which gives an opportunity for people to practice communication as well as uh, teaching and peer feedback. And then in addition, uh, in turn, as a thank you, the EM residents teach our residents how to do fast exams and ultrasound principles. And during these sessions, interns, um, which is geared towards the interns, uh, they get to utilize their teamwork and communication skills, often walking their blindfolded teammates uh, through FAST exams. And so here uh, you can see um, some of our interns, Drs. Ellis, Lee, and Tang, did a great job on communicating uh, in order to walk their colleague through a blindfolded FAST exam. They actually won the ultrasound competition this year, so good job. And then in addition to teaching your peers, you also have the opportunity to work with Harvard and Tufts medical students. And so during your clinical years, they'll work with you directly on the team, which offers you the informal workplace-based workplace teaching opportunity. But then during your lab time or during your research time, there's the opportunity to teach preclinical students in the anatomy lab, as well as complete teaching didactic sessions for their transitions to the clerkship course. In addition, Drs. Sophia McKinley and Taylor Coe, who are on this call, um, have organized a big sibling program, which partners medical students with, re with research resident mentors. So it gives you yet another opportunity for one-on-one -on -one teaching, uh, career guidance, and also to offer them support. And so far, um, over the last couple of years, students have really raved about this program and said how appreciative they are of the residents' teaching uh, and their commitment to the educational mission. So thank you for doing that. And so now to end, um, Dr. Douglas Cassidy, who annually is um, Alex Trebek, will briefly overview the didactic and the absite curriculum uh, before launching into some more Q&A time. That's Thanks. great, thank you. Um, you've answered so many of the questions uh, here, and we have um, a couple things that are less related to SIM and to the didactic time um, that I'll ask uh, to everyone. And there's also some things that are coming in through the chat that we can address as well. Um, how about, uh, this is to all of our education residents, um, how much time do residents spend in didactics? Who decides the curriculum? Um, and when is that? 
So I can I can lead with that. Um, so we have uh, two education uh, chief residents who you know, set the didactic curriculum. We follow the SCORE curriculum. It's a little bit modified from their, the schedule they put out. Um, and we have the flexibility to be able to do that. Uh, our, our teaching sessions are now held over Zoom, which is, you know, one to socially distance, but also allows an opportunity to record the sessions and also allow our residents from who are at our other hospitals at Newton Wellesley and at North Shore Medical Center to be able to participate as well. Uh, and then faculty lead those hour long didactic sessions. Uh, and uh, they will typically kind of follow usually a, uh, like a mock oral uh, kind of uh, teaching session to lead things off before diving into the didactic material. Uh, and then in addition to that, uh, Dr. Mullen provides all of us with a subscription to TrueLearn, which is a question bank uh, for preparation for the app site each year. And then we have a, uh, a resident run app site review course you know, that's kicking off soon, uh, usually a couple months before the app site, where we utilize peer, te peer teaching techniques uh, and kind of a stress-free low-key environment in you know, a small group setting where uh, residents take turns uh, leading a review on certain topics. Uh, it's a great opportunity to get a mix of junior and senior residents who have varying experiences with the exam and also various experiences with uh, you know the OR and, and provide you know different perspectives, uh, it's a wonderful you know 45 minute hour long uh, extracurricular you know learning opportunity uh, that both you know teachers and learners you know really enjoy and cherish. We've done it for three years and uh, we'll be uh, we'll be kicking off our fourth year very soon uh, under the guidance of doctors uh, Secor and uh, Senior this year. Um, how about, do senior residents regularly take the time to teach junior residents? Um, we covered that the research residents are frequently in, in the sim lab leading those sessions, but how do you feel about uh, teaching from seniors to juniors? I, I can also take this one. Um, so I think, you know, sorry, we're dealing with a little Cooper time here, but um, uh, I think that's something that our, our program really prides itself in. Um, we see that kind of all the way throughout the, um, you know, the residency. I think, you know, with our research residents being involved with the junior residents uh, with simulation uh, and, um, you know, for the past, you know, I'll give Sophia a lot of credit for this for the past, you know, couple of years, all, all of our research residents have gone through the residence as teachers program. And it, it, it takes time to foster the, the changing culture, but we now have multiple years of residents who are, who are trained, you know, in, uh, you know, you know, um, education theory and, and providing feedback and how to teach both you know, medical student and, and peer learners. So uh, I think that's a, uh, you know, a huge strength of our program. And our, our senior residents have, have different styles, but we see a variety of teaching, whether it's on the wards, whether it's in the OR, in uh, dual resident cases, uh, or if it's just like chalk talks, you know, we see the evidence, evidence of this in, in the resident lounge and in the sim lab. So I think it's a huge strength of our program. Yeah, and I think that more evidence of our senior residents being really committed to teaching, um, in addition to the high participation rate in the residence as teachers program, is that MGH is the highest regarded surgical clerkship in the Harvard system. And I think that really speaks to the quality of the MGH surgical residents as teachers. Thanks. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a question about cadaver labs. Uh, we don't have frequent cadaver labs. I don't know if any of our seniors have done ACET, which is usually on cadavers. Um, but what we do have is uh, we do some simulation with pigs. Um, so maybe you guys can talk a little bit about those types of things. Sure, and the, um, 
With a lot of the simulation curriculum, uh, some of the cadaveric simulations are actually being incorporated as the robotic training program is um, both built up and then also um, revived by Dr. G and one of the urology attending. So they're trying to do a, a cadaveric robotic training program or cadaveric lab twice a year, uh, in addition to the porcine endoscopy, um, colonoscopy and uh, robotic training. So that's regularly built in. And then during your lab time or research time, if you um, volunteer to teach medical students, which is a, a paid volunteering opportunity, you'll get to um, teach a lot in the cadaver lab, which gives you an opportunity to also um, not only review your anatomy, but um, hone in on your teaching skills and on your um, and keep up with your uh, dissection and uh, surgical skills while out in the lab. So that's another great opportunity. And I think there are also opportunities for, I don't know about now with COVID, but before COVID, for example, like I'd gone to Atlanta to do a robotic training course on cadavers down there um, that was uh, supported by both the company and the, and the residency program. And I know several of our senior residents have done that, that, uh, that course. And so there's opportunities not just at MGH, but uh, also hopefully once things settle down with the pandemic uh, outside of MGH uh, as well. Okay, and um, I think it's probably worth noting that in, to our, in addition to our formal didactics time, which is every Thursday morning when we have M&M, Grand Rounds, lecture, sim time, in which that time is protected, a lot of services have other teaching opportunities. So our trauma service has teaching conferences, our pancreas service has pancreas rounds, there's liver rounds. So within the rotation that you are on, there are other learning opportunities as well. Uh, does anyone else have questions or comments you want to make about education, Sim? Okay. So it's eight o'clock now. I don't want anyone who um, to have to stay on longer. I am happy to stay on because we've covered our main topics, but I have a whole lot of questions about the schedule and the culture of the program and, and what it's like that um, I'm happy to address some of if there's residents who want to stay on maybe for another uh, 15 minutes. Uh, I think that would be great. But if if any of you have to go, I appreciate your time and, and you're uh, welcome to exit now. So um, I'll start with a couple of questions that we have about um, the call and the schedule. I don't know if we have any interns on right now. I know we did earlier. Um, if we do or some hey, of Maggie, that. I'm like briefly on, but I'm on hey. tonight, so we'll have to go. Through. Oh, I see D is here too. All right, intern. What's the intern schedule like? So I'm on um, the Baker Night Float, which means that I cover half of the um, the eight teams of Baker, which is the elective surgery service. So I get in here at like 5.45 p.m. We um, get sign out at six, and then technically I'm supposed to be going around to see the patients right now, which I'm about to do. Um, and then we sign out at 6 a.m. Perfect. And um, how much OR time or exposure do you get as an intern? Um, I think that it really depends on the rotation you're on. Clearly, the rotation I'm on right now is pretty limited, given that most of our patients do very well and don't need overnight surgery. Um, so other surgery services like Churchill, Knights, um, I think when I was on colorectal, I had plenty of time in the OR. Um, and I think D probably can speak more to this than me. I, I'm trying to think about like what other, oh, so I just got off of Burns and I was in the OR every day. There were like four cases every day and it was expected that we would go to the OR and be able to actively participate. Yeah, I'll echo that. Um, I think the services where we get the, the most time are um, definitely when you're on a Baker service, not only because you go to cases with your own service, but um, cases on like the breast service or the endocrine service where there aren't, there isn't necessarily a dedicated resident often get filled by interns. So um, like today I did four breast cases with Dr. Smith and it was awesome. Um, so yeah, I would say we get a lot of OR time on Baker services and then on Churchill, like Panda is alluding to, um, 
which is our trauma acute care service. It's, I wouldn't say as much OR time, but what is very cool is that that's where we get um, a lot of cases that we go through with our senior residents. And I would say that's like been a really um, special and very high yield learning time during intern year. And I think that when we do cover the cases, especially um, if we are the only resident covering the case, the expectation is still that we are the ones doing the case. And so we have a lot of autonomy. So when I was on colorectal as a second year intern, there was a Hartman's procedure that I was able to do with the attending. Um, and Sahil, who's one of the chiefs, very kindly gifted this to me. And so obviously with supervision, but um, I, I would say that the operative experience here is excellent and everyone, including the seniors and the attendings are very invested in teaching you to operate. That's great. And just to, to follow or to give a little bit more numbers for that, uh, somebody was asking about the number of cases that that interns get. So I have the data from for the 2019 interns and the average number of cases for the year for then was 114. Um, and then as you go up each year, uh, all our case, our chiefs all graduated with a thousand plus cases logged. Um, so we have no shortage of cases and, and interns are definitely getting in the operating room and when they're there, they're doing something other than standing and watching. Um, there's questions about the APPs and how they uh, factor into our services. Does anyone want to talk about um, your experience having an NP or a PA on your team? I can talk about that. Um, I do think that as interns, we probably have the most interface with them. Like, um, and something that I've one really come to appreciate is how much the presence of APPs on essentially every service means, like that's what creates the opportunity for us to be in the OR all day as interns. Um, because if you were like also responsible for responding to all of your patients and those pages, then that would be pretty challenging. And so that's, that's really um, the exception, not the rule. So I very much appreciate that the department has committed like, you know, the dollars and the time and the resources to having APPs. And I think that um, they live on those services and they have so much to teach us about that thing. And um, I think the relationships that we have with them are like not only fruitful in both directions because we learn a lot, but then also because it does mean we get to go to the OR and they're pretty fun, like for the most part. <laughs> Sophia, maybe you can uh, answer some of the questions about how much autonomy is there in the schedule? How does vacation work? Um, that's so, sort of like, how do you do your, your planning of your year? Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, the policy for vacation is that interns will get four weeks of vacation. That is four single weeks. And one of those weeks is a major holiday. So Thanksgiving, New Year's, or Christmas. And you will submit your vacation preferences after matching to the program director and the program manager. And Dr. Mullen does a fair amount of the intern schedule, but at some point he got kind of tired of it and <laughs> sent it along to me and Brooks, who are the administrative chief residents, and I filled out the rest of the vacations and holidays for the interns um, in a way that would be fair and balanced across the year. Um, and then for the PGY twos to fives, I think as you get more senior, there's more independence in your schedule making. So the PGY4s are expected to make the entire clinical schedule for their own class year. And the PGY5s certainly do that. I think um, different second and third year classes have different degrees of ownership over the schedule and how they take their vacation. Um, but I think that uh, Dr. Mullen is nice to a fault sometimes when it comes to resident schedule making and sometimes I get to assume the role of the bad cop when it comes to the schedule um, just because 
you know, you need a certain number of residents working in the hospital and a certain number of rotations that need to be required. And fall in New England is amazing, but not every resident can have the first two weeks of October off. So um, I think that we have a very fair schedule. I think that we have a history of administrative chief residents who are very responsive. I hope nobody feels like I'm unfair or that I'm not approachable. Um, and we certainly, I think, we haven't talked about it, but I think we have an incredible culture of cross coverage. And that um, one really unique thing about MGH is that residents cover each other generously and not necessarily with the expectation that every hour gets repaid. And um, the chief residents do that for each other. When somebody was on a COVID-19 rule out, uh, the chief residents covered that person's job without complaint. And I think that's the, the role modeling that we hope to do for the rest of the residency. Thank you. Uh, there was another question, do golden weekends exist? And I'll answer that, yes, they do. Um, do night floats exist? Yes, they do. Um, it's, it, we, for the most part, like having the night float system it, so that we are always awake and operating when we're on a service. Um, it makes sense to, to most people to to have a month of night float time in order to have to be on during the daytime when you're on pancreas or whatever. Um, to move on from there, maybe I can ask uh, some of the seniors to talk about, there's several questions about what other hospitals we rotate at and how much time we spend there. Do you need a car to go to the other hospitals and sort of what's different between those hospitals and the MGH? I can talk because I'm at Salem right now. <laughs> um, so um, we have two kind of uh, what we would call community rotations, um, one at Newton Wellesley Hospital, which is probably about a 15 or 20 minute drive, depending on the traffic. Um, never eat soggy waffles west of the west. city. <laughs> Um, and then uh, there's another rotation up at Salem Hospital, which is about a 25 minute drive north of the city. Um, it's definitely not a requirement that you have a car. Um, in fact, like we carpool to both of those locations and uh, we actually have a residency wide Uber account that's used for post call days if you don't have a car. Um, and it's also used if you have a car and you're just really tired and need to get home. Um, on top of that, thank you. <laughs> um, near Salem Hospital is an outpatient surgery center called Danvers. And uh, we go there as fourth years for at least a month. Um, and those are just day surgery cases. And so I spent six weeks at Danvers for the first uh, six weeks of my PGY4 year when I was um, 34 to 40 weeks pregnant and it was perfect um, and the attendings there just want to teach because they have time the OR turnover is like 10 minutes um, the stressors of all the things at bigger hospitals just disappear um, so I think that's where you kind of learn how to really do the cases yourself because they give you that autonomy as a PGY4 um, I can answer any questions about the Salem or Newton Wellesley experience. Um, I was at Newton Wellesley as a medical student um, and have kind of now been there since 2013, almost once a year. So if anyone has any specific questions, I'll put my um, email in the chat. Great, and that also, there was a question about, um, are there any changes being considered to the schedule for the upcoming years? So there's an additional outpatient surgery center that we are considering having a uh, rotation for a PGY2 or 3 go to. So that would be another experience for a more junior resident to be able to get to do some outpatient uh, surgery that would be similar to Danvers. Um, let's see. Uh, does anyone want to talk about how you interact with other residents of other specialties like ortho, EM, IM. Does anyone have any friends or how do you, do you know anyone on other, in other residencies here? Sure, 
I can do that. It's kind of fun. As interns, we're kind of all in a pool together. So you'll interact with the urology, the interventional radiology, ophthalmology, plastic surgery, um, and a few other programs that rotate through general surgery. And you end up becoming very good friends with these folks. In fact, uh, one of the urology residents is um, one of my good friends and we still you know, like go to the gym. Well, we used to go to the gym together back when that sort of thing was allowable, but uh, it's a, it, what it does is build a great sense of um, camaraderie across the programs because inevitably you interact with these people throughout the duration of your training, whether it's sharing a patient who has a, a, a multi-system trauma or having trouble with a complicated urologic problem at night and you can just call someone who's your friend. Um, and also, you know, they're just these incredible people who are very good at what they do. And even as you go throughout your training, you know, you can run into a problem. I remember being at like children's hospital, having some like complicated um, uh, ENT problem that I didn't know anything about. And I just called someone and they answered the phone right away and said, oh, no, it's just this. Don't worry about it. So it's um, it definitely a very collaborative uh, sort of environment. Um, with a lot of people who you'll be friends with, I think, hopefully for the rest of your life. Um, was that the question, Maggie? I don't know. I started talking and yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. Um, and uh, how about what are some favorite rotations of the residents? I think that's going to vary a little bit by it, it, what people are interested in, but I will say that there are some rotations that, that everybody really loves or most people really love. Um, maybe we could have a junior, a mid-level, and a senior talk about some of your favorite rotations. I think that the chief resident year is something that's really special about MGH. And I think you do a lot of work to get to that point. As a resident, you do a lot of really hard work, a lot of really hard rotations. And then when you're a chief resident, you do these incredible rotations working with like world famous abdominal GI surgeons. Um, who are nationally or internationally regarded doing really complex general surgery. One of the crown jewels of our program is an apprenticeship rotation with the world-renowned pancreas surgeon, Dr. Fernandez, where it's just you and the intern and him, and you're both always with him, whether it's in clinic or in the operating room. I think that's a really special rotation. And then prior to my chief year, my favorite rotation was at Salem Hospital, where you are covering every surgical service when you're on call, thoracic, trauma, acute care surgery, general surgery. Um, and I think that's like a really fun experience because you're using all parts of your surgical brain in a 24 hour period. And, and it's a, a place where as a second year resident, if you see a consult on an operative case, that's your case and no senior can take that away from you. And I think that's a really special rotation at MGH. A lot of students wonder about not having a VA hospital as a rotation site. And I think that going to Salem more than makes up for the fact that we don't rotate at a VA. And it's, I certainly don't feel like I've lost something in my training by not going to a VA site. Um, and I think Salem or North Shore Medical Center is something really special about our training program that people aren't always aware of. Thank you. Um, we have a couple questions about diversity of the residency and of the patient population. So I'll start with just some numbers and then if anyone wants to jump in on that uh, topic, please feel free. So for the residency, MGH surgery is 15.3% underrepresented minorities and MGH training overall is 17.2%. And on, when you look at the graduating applicants going into surgery, that is just about average with uh, the numbers in terms of underrepresented minorities. We're also 58% females within our uh, residency program. And um, there's more work to be done. Uh, I think everywhere there's more work to be done. So we have a um, committee for diversity and inclusion and they have several different programs within that uh, program uh, for career development, for cultural competency training. So many of us have taken uh, this training course about 
um, sensitivity and, and perhaps uh, somebody can talk about that a little bit. Chuck, why don't you, are you, do we have any other DEI committee members here? Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Chuck, I'm one of the chief residents. Um, yeah, um, I have to say diversity and, and inclusion is uh, something that is, is near and dear to the hearts of many people um, in the surgery program and it's just growing um, in importance uh, with, with each year. Uh, now there uh, are a couple of the uh, members of the Department of Surgery Surgery Leadership and Dr. Parangi and Dr. Seni who um, are leading up efforts both um, on recruiting of uh, faculty um, from um, groups that are traditionally um, not as uh, have not been as prioritized, unfortunately, um, as well as at the uh, resident level. And um, there's uh, a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of interest in sort of dynamism and uh, in that, and also that uh, goes into um, efforts on the um, the education side of things, including uh, components of the didactic program that looks at um, training and, and cultural competency, as well as um, on the areas of research and how to um, uh, take on some of the challenges that uh, exist in sort of modern American society. Um, and, um, you know, uh, doctors, again, Dr. Lilla Merle and Mullen have been incredibly supportive of all of these efforts. Um, and um, and if this is a topic for which you uh, are, are interested, um, I can chat with you more um, in the chat or via email. And uh, the program would be just head over heels excited to uh, to work with you to um, really kind of make any of those kind of efforts come to fruition. In fact, the chat is all compliments to you. Um, and it's all true as well. Um, thank you for, for that. And um, just to continue with diversity, uh, there's questions about our patient population. So 13% uh, of our inpatients at MGH are African American or Hispanic, and 17.6% of our primary care outpatients are um, African American or Hispanic. And at the MGH, because we're a large, uh, well-known hospital, we care for patients from over 140 countries. We have medical interpreter services that are available 24-7. Um, and we also have uh, a, a set of popu uh, a, a community of, of um, patients from Chelsea who mostly go to the community health center uh, which is part of the MGH that's 50% Latino, 9% Black, and 30% um, of them indicate Spanish as their preferred language. So that's a whole lot of numbers, but it's, it's the sort of the gist of who our patients are in terms of uh, how diverse the population is. And that's relatively um, representative of, of the area in Boston where we work. Um, does anyone have comments about the patients that we take care of? Maggie, I think I just wanted to throw in that um, I see that Numo was mentioned in the chat because, um, you know, during COVID, um, Boston was no different than many of the other places that were hit in the United States and that it predominantly affected a very large Hispanic and Black population. And so MGH was actually the first hospital in the country to develop a Spanish language care group. So that was a group of physicians um, who were qualified bilingual um, speakers who um, would volunteer additional time in the hospital covering ICUs, floors, and the emergency department, not to provide clinical care, but to actually be um, uh, interpreters uh, for Spanish-speaking patients. And the value of being a physician and having been on that team is that um, 
this goes beyond just using the typical sort of medical translator who would just verbatim sort of go back and forth and, and say what you wanted to say as a clinician, but it really um, gave the opportunity to have culturally competent conversations with these patients um, with whom we were having some very serious conversations around um, possibly end of life care and um, what were these patients' goals regarding intubation, tracheostomy, um, intensive care needs, withdrawal of care. I think these are all things that, um, as you can imagine, are scary to talk about to begin with, and even much harder when um, culturally you may not be able to speak English and understand the same types of um, aphorisms that we may be using in English. And so I think it was a, a huge benefit to be able to organize that. And that model was replicated in New York, in, in Baltimore, uh, Los Angeles, Chicago, um, based on the MGH model. And we had several people within the Department of Surgery that were participating in that team. And Numa, um, and Numa Perez in, in particular was leading that group uh, on behalf of the Department of Surgery uh, with the MGH um, uh, Community um, Diversity Inclusion um, uh, group. And so I think uh, it's definitely a place where MGH is, uh, is leading or trying to lead, certainly within, within the city um, and within our um, patient catchment area that includes Chelsea, which is predominantly Spanish speaking, as, Mag as Maggie mentioned. There, were, there was a question also about sort of community engagement and, uh, and et cetera in the uh, chat. And I do just want to highlight that there are some programs that have been largely um, resident driven to um, work with different uh, groups in the community. And, and uh, one in particular um, works with children who are um, actually identified through their schools or through the um, um, supportive services in, in the area um, as being sort of at risk for uh, not having uh, adequate supports at home and whatnot. And we've worked with them um, pretty extensively. We've gone and done some teaching with them on, on health related issues as well as uh, just spending time sort of um, playing sports with them and, and trying to uh, get to know them better. Um, there's some very humorous pictures of me playing basketball, but, um, and then, uh, and then also uh, we have um, participated in some programs for um, underrepresented minority high school students who are interested in, in healthcare fields and working with them to um, get more exposure to surgery and medicine and to um, work towards seeing those dreams uh, come about. Awesome. So it's 8.27, so I'm gonna finish with two, um, Quick questions. The first one I'll answer because I sent it to Dr. Mullen. Um, it's uh, what kinds of physicians does the MGH hope to train? And his answer is great technical surgeons and future leaders in American surgery. And I think that's exactly what we all aspire to be. And the last question that I'll just have any resident who is interested in answering is what's the best part about being a surgical resident at the MGH? Um, I'll take a stab at this, um, and I would say more than the training and more than even our program director and uh, chair, who are amazing, uh, is to a question somebody brought up earlier is just how invested my co-residents are in me. And that sounds extremely selfish, but it is the truth. Um, nobody will let me fail, and people will make sure that I push myself. Um, to be the best version of me that I can be. Come here. This really is a family. And, um, you know, there's no other family that I want to be a part of for the past, you know, six years. Um, everyone here, and I've seen it, you know, whether it's affected me personally or my family, uh, or whether or not it's been for my colleagues, but everyone here would drop what they're doing at a moment's notice and cover for each other and help each other out and be there for one another. And I don't know if, if you get that anywhere else, but I know you get that here and I can speak for that. And I'm very grateful for my colleagues for the support they've provided both me and my family, you know, for the past six years. So it's, it's definitely the group here on this screen and in this program.
it's like a lifetime movie all of a sudden i don't know yeah exactly all right um does anyone else have any questions they want to uh, ask now or else we'll end our session. It's it's 8.30 and we appreciate that everyone stayed on for this long to, to chat. All right. Thanks, everyone. Maggie, real fast, yeah. are, are, is our contact information available to everyone somewhere? It, uh, I'll just put it in the chat. Yeah, some people have been putting it in the chat. Um, I can also, I have everybody who's attended email addresses, so I can send out an email if, if you guys want. Um, or you can contact me because everyone who's in attendance has gotten an email from me and I can put you in contact with the, with the right people. Before everyone leaves, just a quick shout out to Maggie for putting these together and her hard work and you know, making, you know, us accessible to, you know, answer all your questions and, and organize this. So I think everyone should just recognize, you know, at least we all appreciate the work we did doing this. Thanks. Okay. Appreciate everyone showing up. The first one, I didn't know if anyone was going to show up. So it's awesome to see over 100 people here wanting to hear about the MGH and, and so much resident involvement. Um, this has been really great. All right, let's let's call it. Thank you all.